welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we're going to continue our reading of The Man Who Was Thursday by G.K. Chesterton. Our hero, Gabriel Syme, is a police detective who has infiltrated the World Anarchist Organization by assuming the role of Thursday on their Council of Days. And now he is about to meet the rest of the Council. Chapter 5, The Feast of Fear. At first, the large stone stair seemed to Syme as deserted as a pyramid, but before he reached the top, he had realized that there was a man leaning over the parapet of the embankment and looking out across the river. As a figure, he was quite conventional, clad in a silk hat and frock coat of the more formal type of fashion. He had a red flower in his buttonhole. As Syme drew nearer to him, step by step, he did not even move a hair and Syme could come close enough to notice even in the dim, pale morning light that his face was long, pale, and intellectual, and ended in a small triangular tuft of dark beard at the very point of the chin, all else being clean-shaven. This scrap of hair almost seemed a mere oversight. The rest of the face was of the type that is best shaven, clear-cut, ascetic, and in its way noble. Syme drew closer and closer, noting all this, and still the figure did not stir. At first, an instinct told Syme that this was the man whom he was meant to meet. Then, seeing that the man made no sign, he had concluded that he was not. And now again, he had come back to a certainty that the man had something to do with his mad adventure, for the man remained more still than would have been natural if a stranger had come so close. He was as motionless as a waxwork, and got on the nerves somewhat in the same way. Syme looked again and again at the deba- pale, dignified, and delicate face and the face still looked blankly across the river. Then he took out of his pocket the note from Buttons proving his election and put it before that sad and beautiful face. Then the man smiled, and his smile was a shock, for it was all on one side, going up in the right cheek and down in the left. There was nothing, rationally speaking, to scare anyone about this. Many people have this nervous trick of a crooked smile, and in many it is even attractive. But in all Syme's circumstances, with the dark dawn and the deadly errand and the loneliness on the great dripping stones, there was something unnerving in it. There was the silent river and the silent man, a man of even classic face, and there was the last nightmare touch that his smile suddenly went wrong. The spasm of smile was instantaneous, and the man's face dropped at once into its harmonious melancholy. He spoke without further explanation or inquiry, like a man speaking to an old colleague. If we walk up toward Leicester Square, we shall just be in time for breakfast. Sunday always insists on early breakfast. Have you had any sleep? No, said Syme. Nor have I, answered the man in an ordinary tone. I shall try to get to bed after breakfast. He spoke with casual civility, but in an utterly dead voice that contradicted the fanaticism of his face. It seemed almost as if all friendly words were to him lifeless conveniences, and that his only life was hate. After a pause, the man spoke again. Of course, the secretary of the branch told you everything that can be told, but the one thing that can never be told is the last notion of the president, for his notions grow like a tropical forest. So, in case you don't know, I had better tell you that he is carrying out his notion of concealing ourselves by not concealing ourselves to the most extraordinary lengths just now. Originally, of course, we met in a cell underground, just as your branch does. Then Sunday made us take a private room at an ordinary restaurant. He said that if you didn't seem to be hiding, nobody hunted you out. Well, he is the only man on earth, I know. But sometimes I really think that his huge brain is going a little mad in its old age. For now we flaunt ourselves before the public. We have our breakfast on a balcony, on a balcony, if you please, overlooking Leicester Square. And what do people say? asked Syme. It's quite simple what they say, answered his guide. They say we are a lot of jolly gentlemen who pretend they are anarchists. It seems to me a very clever plan, said Syme. Clever! God blast your impudence! Clever! cried out the other in a sudden shrill voice which was as startling and discordant as his crooked smile. When you've seen Sunday for a split second, you'll leave off calling him clever. 
With this, they emerged out on a narrow street and saw the early sunlight filling Leicester Square. It will never be known, I suppose, why this square itself should look so alien and in some ways so continental. It will never be known whether it was the foreign look that attracted the foreigners or the foreigners who gave it the foreign look. But on this particular morning, the effect seemed singularly bright and clear. Between the open square and the sunlit leaves and the statue and the Sar Saracenic outlines of the Alhambra, it looked like the replica of some French or even Spanish public place. And this effect increased in Syme the sensation which in many shapes he had had through the whole adventure, the eerie sensation of having strayed into a new world. As a fact, he had bought bad cigars round Leicester Square ever since he was a boy. But as he turned that corner and saw the trees and the Moorish cupolas, he could have sworn that he was turning into an unknown place de something or other in some foreign town. At one corner of the square there projected a kind of angle of a prosperous but quiet hotel, the bulk of which belonged to a street behind. In the wall there was one large French window, probably the window of a large coffee room, and outside this window, almost literally overhanging the square, was a formidably dressed buttressed balcony, big enough to contain a dining table. In fact, it did contain a dining table, or more strictly, a breakfast table, and round the breakfast table, glowing in the sunlight and evident to the street, were a group of noisy and talkative men, all dressed in the insolence of fashion, with white waistcoats and expensive buttonholes. Some of their jokes could almost be heard across the square. Then the grave secretary gave his unnatural smile, and Syme knew that this boisterous breakfast party was the secret conclave of the European dynamiters. Then, as Syme continued to stare at them, he saw something that he had not seen before. He had not seen it literally because it was too large to see. At the nearest end of the balcony, blocking up a great part of the perspective, was the back of a great mountain of a man. When Syme had seen him, his first thought was that the weight of him must break down the balcony of stone. His vastness did not lie only in the fact that he was abnormally tall and quite incredibly fat. This man was planned enormously in his original proportions, like a statue carved deliberately as colossal. His head, crowned with white hair, as seen from behind, looked bigger than a head ought to be. The ears that stood out from it looked larger than human ears. He was enlarged terribly to scale, and this sense of size was so staggering that when Syme saw him all the other figures seemed quite suddenly to dwindle and become dwarvish. If they were still sitting there as before with their flowers and frock coats, they now looked as if the big man was entertaining five children to tea. As Syme and the guide approached the side door of the hotel, a waiter came out smiling with every tooth in his head. The gentlemen are up there, sir, he said. They do talk and they do laugh at what they talk. They do say they will throw bombs at the king. And the waiter hurried away with a napkin over his arm, much pleased with the singular frivolity of the gentlemen upstairs. The two men mounted the stairs in silence. Syme had never thought of asking whether the monstrous man who almost filled and broke the balcony was the great president of whom the others stood in awe. He knew it was so with an unaccountable but instantaneous certainty. Syme, indeed, was one of those men who were open to all the more nameless psychological influences in a degree a little dangerous to mental health. Utterly devoid of fear and physical dangers, he was a great deal too sensitive to the smell of spiritual evil. Twice already that night, little unmeaning things had peeped out at him almost puriently and given him a sense of drawing nearer and nearer to the headquarters of hell. And this sense became overpowering as he drew nearer to the great president. The form it took was a childish and yet hateful fancy. As he walked across the inner room toward the balcony, the large face of Sunday grew larger and larger, and Syme was gripped with a fear that when he was quite close, the face would be too big to be possible, and he would scream aloud. He remembered that as a child he would not look at the mask of Memnon in the British Museum because it was a face and so large. By an effort braver than that of leaping over a cliff, he went to an empty seat at the breakfast table and sat down. The men greeted him with good-humored raillery as if they had always known him. 
He sobered himself a little by looking at their conventional coats and solid, shining coffee pot. Then he looked again at Sunday. His face was very large, but it was still possible to humanity. In the presence of the president, the whole company looked sufficiently commonplace. Nothing about them caught the eye at first, except that the president's caprice had dressed them up with a festive respectability, which gave the meal the look of a wedding breakfast. One man, indeed, stood out at even a superficial glance. He, at least, was the common or garden dynamiter. He wore, indeed, the high white collar and satin tie that was the uniform of the occasion, but out of this collar there sprang a head quite unmanageable and quite unmistakable, a bewildering bush of brown hair and beard that almost obscured the eyes like those of a sky terrier. But the eyes did look out of the tangle, and they were the sad eyes of some Russian serf. The effect of this figure was not terrible like that of the president, but it had every diablerie that can come from the utterly grotesque. If out of that stiff tie and collar there had come abruptly the head of a cat or a dog, it could not have been a more idiotic contrast. The man's name, it seemed, was Gogol. He was a Pole, and in his, this circle of days he was called Tuesday. His soul and speech were incurably tragic. He could not force himself to play the prosperous and frivolous part demanded of him by President Sunday. And indeed, when Syme came in, the president, with that daring disregard of public suspicion which was his policy, was actually chafing Gogol upon his inability to assume conventional graces. Our friend Tuesday, said the president in a deep voice at once of quietude and volume, our friend Tuesday doesn't seem to grasp the idea. He dresses up like a gentleman, but he seems too great a soul to behave like one. He insists on the ways of the stage conspirator. Now, if a gentleman goes about London in a top hat and a frock coat, no one need know he is an anarchist. But if a gentleman puts on a top hat and frock coat and then goes about on his hands and knees, well, he may attract attention. That's what Brother Gogol does. He goes about on his hands and knees with such inexhaustible diplomacy that by this time he finds it quite difficult to walk upright. I am not good at concealment, said Gogol sulkily with a thick foreign accent. I am not ashamed of the cause. Yes, you are, my boy, and so is the cause of you, said the president good-naturedly. You hide as much as anybody, but you can't do it, you see. You're such an ass. You try to combine two inconsistent methods. When a householder finds a man under his bed, he will probably pause to note the circumstance. But if he finds a man under his bed in a top hat, you will agree with me, my dear Tuesday, that he is not likely even to forget it. Now, when you were found under Admiral Biffin's bed... I am not good at deception, said Tuesday gloomily, flushing. Right, my boy, right, said the president with a ponderous heartiness. You aren't good at anything. Whilst this stream of conversation continued, Syme was looking more steadily at the men around him. As he did so, he gradually felt all his sense of something spiritually queer return. He had thought at first that they were all of common stature and costume, with the evident exception of the hairy Gogol. But as he looked at the others, he began to see in each of them exactly what he had seen in the man by the river, a demoniac detail somewhere. That lopsided laugh, which would suddenly disfigure the fine face of his original guide, was typical of all these types. Each man had something about him, perceived perhaps at the tenth or twentieth glance, which was not normal and which seemed hardly human. The only metaphor he could think of was this that they all looked as men of fashion and presence would look, with the additional twist given in a false and curved mirror. Only the individual examples will express this half-concealed eccentricity. Syme's original Cicerone bore the title of Monday. He was the secretary of the council, and his twisted smile was regarded with more terror than anything except the president's horrible, happy laughter. But now that Syme had more space and light to observe him, there were other touches. His fine face was so emaciated that Syme thought it must be wasted with some disease. Yet somehow the very distress of his dark eyes denied this. It was no physical ill that troubled him. His eyes were alive with intellectual torture, as if pure thought was pain. He was typical of each of the tribe. Each man was subtly and differently wrong. Next to him sat Tuesday, the tousle-headed Gogol, a man more obviously mad. Next was Wednesday, a certain Marquis de Saint-Eustache, a sufficiently characteristic figure. 
The first few glances found nothing unusual about him, except that he was the only man at table who wore the fashionable clothes as if they were really his own. He had a black French beard cut square and a black English frock, cut, frock coat cut even squarer. But Syme, sensitive to such things, felt somehow that the man carried a rich atmosphere with him, a rich atmosphere that suffocated. It reminded one irrationally of drowsy odors and of dying lamps in the darker poems of Byron and Poe. With this went a sense of his being clad not in lighter colors but in softer materials. His black seemed richer and warmer than the black shades about him, as if it were compounded of profound color. His black coat looked as if it were only black by being too dense a purple. His black beard looked as if it were only black by being too deep a blue. And in the gloom and thickness of the beard, his dark red mouth showed sensual and scornful. Whatever he was, he was not a Frenchman. He might be a Jew. He might be something deeper yet in the dark heart of the East. In the bright colored Persian tiles and pictures showing tyrants hunting, you may see just those almond eyes, those blue-black beards, those cruel crimson lips. Then came Syme, and next a very old man, Professor de Vorms, who still kept the chair of Friday, though every day it was expected that his death would leave it empty. Save for his intellect, he was in the last dissolution of senile decay. His face was as gray as his long gray beard. His forehead was lifted and fixed finally in a furrow of mild despair. In no other case, not even that of Gogol, did the bridegroom brilliancy of the morning dress express a more painful contrast. For the red flower in his buttonhole showed up against a face that was literally discolored like lead. The whole hideous effect was as if some drunken dandies had put their clothes on a corpse. When he rose or sat down, which was with long labor and peril, something worse was expressed than mere weakness, something indefinable connected with the horror of the whole scene. It did not express decrepitude merely, but corruption. Another hateful fancy crossed Syme's quivering mind. He could not help thinking that whenever the man moved, a leg or arm might fall off. Right at the end sat the man called Saturday, the simplest and most baffling of all. He was a short, square man with a dark, square face, clean-shaven, a medical practitioner going by the name of Bull. He had that combination of savoir-faire with a sort of well-groomed coarseness which is not uncommon in young doctors. He carried his fine clothes with confidence rather than ease, and he mostly wore a set smile. There was nothing whatever odd about him except that he wore a pair of dark, almost opaque spectacles. It may have been merely a crescendo of nervous fancy that had gone before, but those black discs were dreadful to Syme. They reminded him of half-remembered ugly tales, of some story about pennies being put on the eyes of the dead. Syme's eye always caught the black glasses and the blind grin. Had the dying professor worn them, or even the pale secretary, they would have been appropriate. But on the younger and grosser man, they seemed only an enigma. They took away the key of the face. You could not tell what his smile or his gravity meant. Partly from this, and partly because he had a vulgar virility wanting in most of the others, it seemed to Syme that he might be the wickedest of all those wicked men. Syme even had the thought that his eyes might be covered up because they were too frightful to see. Chapter 6, The Exposure Such were the six men who had sworn to destroy the world. Again and again, Syme strove to pull together his common sense in their presence. Sometimes he saw for an instant that these notions were subjective, that he was only looking at ordinary men, one of whom was old, another nervous, another short-sighted. The sense of an unnatural symbolism always settled back on him again. Each figure seemed to be somehow on the borderland of things, just as their theory was on the borderland of thought. He knew that each one of these men stood at the extreme end, so to speak, of some wild road of reasoning. He could only fancy, as in some old world fable, that if a man went westward to the end of the world, he would find something, say a tree, that was more or less than a tree, a tree possessed by a spirit and that if he went east to the end of the world, he would find something else that was not holy itself, a tower, perhaps, of which the very shape was wicked. So these figures seemed to stand up, violent and unaccountable, against an ultimate horizon, visions from the verge. The ends of the earth were closing in. 
Talk had been going on steadily as he took in the scene, and not the least of the contrasts of that bewildering breakfast table was the contrast between the easy and unobtrusive tone of talk and its terrible purport. They were deep in the discussion of an actual and immediate plot. The waiter downstairs had spoken quite correctly when he said that they were talking about bombs and kings. Only three days afterward, the Tsar was to meet the President of the French Republic in Paris, and over their bacon and eggs upon their sunny balcony, these beaming gentlemen had decided how both should die. Even the instrument was chosen. The black-bearded Marquis, it appeared, was to carry the bomb. Ordinarily speaking, the proximity of this positive and objective crime would have sobered Syme and cured him of all his merely mystical tremors. He would have thought of nothing but the need of saving at least two human bodies from being ripped in pieces with iron and roaring gas. But the truth was that by this time he'd begun to feel a third kind of fear, more piercing and practical than either his moral revulsion or his social responsibility. Very simply, he had no fear to spare for the French president or the Tsar. He had begun to fear for himself. Most of the talkers took little heed of him, debating now with their faces closer together and almost uniformly grave, save for when an instant smile of the secretary ran a slant across his face as the jagged lightning runs a slant across the sky. But there was one persistent thing which first troubled Syme and at last terrified him. The president was always looking at him steadily and with a great and baffling interest. The enormous man was quite quiet, but his blue eyes stood out of his head, and they were always fixed on Syme. Syme felt moved to spring up and leap over the balcony. When the president's eyes were on him, he felt as if he were made of glass. He had hardly the shred of a doubt that in some silent and extraordinary way, Sunday had found out that he was a spy. He looked over the edge of the balcony and saw a policeman standing abstractedly just beneath, staring at the bright railings and the sunlit trees. Then there fell upon him the great temptation that was to torment him for many days. In the presence of these powerful and repulsive men who were the princes of anarchy, he had almost forgotten the frail and fanciful figure of the poet Gregory, the mere aesthete of anarchism. He even thought of him now with an old kindness as if they had played together when children but he remembered that he was still tied to Gregory by a great promise. He had promised never to do the very thing that he now felt himself almost in the act of doing. He had promised not to jump over that balcony and speak to that policeman. He took his cold hand off the cold stone balustrade. His soul swayed in a vertigo of moral indecision. He had only to snap the thread of a rash vow to make a villainous society made to a villainous society, and all his life could be as open and sunny as the square beneath him. He had, on the other hand, only to keep his antiquated honor and be delivered inch by inch into the power of this great enemy of mankind, whose very intellect was a torture chamber. Whenever he looked down into the square, he saw the comfortable policeman, a pillar of common sense and common order. Whenever he looked back at the breakfast table, he saw the president still quietly studying him with big, unbearable eyes. In all the torrent of his thought, there were two thoughts that never crossed his mind. First, it never occurred to him to doubt that the president and his council could crush him if he continued to stand alone. The place might be public, the project might seem impossible, but Sunday was not the man who would carry himself thus easily without having somehow or somewhere set open his iron trap. Either by anonymous poison or sudden street accident, by hypnotism or by fire from hell, Sunday could certainly strike him. If he defied the man, he was probably dead, either struck stiff there in his chair or long afterwards as by an innocent ailment. If he called in the police promptly, arrested every one, told all, and set against them the whole energy of England, he would probably escape. Certainly not otherwise. They were a balcony full of gentlemen overlooking a bright and busy square, but he felt no more safe with them than if they had been a boat full of armed pirates overlooking an empty sea. There was a second thought that never came to him. It never occurred to him to be spiritually won over to the enemy. Many, many moderns, inured to a weak worship of intellect and force, might have wavered in their allegiance under this oppression of a great personality. They might have called Sunday the Superman, if any such creature be conceivable, he looked indeed somewhat like it, with his earth-shaking abstraction as of a stone statue walking. 
he might have been called something above man with his large plans which were too obvious to be detected, with his large face which was too frank to be understood. But this was a kind of modern meanness to which Syme could not sink even in his extreme morbidity. Like any man, he was coward enough to fear great force, but he was not quite coward enough to admire it. The men were eating as they talked, and even in this they were typical. Dr. Bull and the Marquis ate casually and conversationally of the best things on the table, cold pheasant or Strasbourg pie, but the secretary was a vegetarian and he spoke earnestly of the projected murder of over half a raw tomato and three quarters of a glass of tepid water. The old professor had such slops as suggested a sickening second childhood. And even in this, President Sunday preserved his curious predominance of mere mass, for he ate like twenty men. He ate incredibly, with a frightful freshness of appetite, so that it was like watching a sausage factory. Yet continually, when he had swallowed a dozen crumpets or drunk a quart of coffee, he would be found with his great head on one side, staring at Syme. I have often wondered, said the Marquis, taking a great bite out of a slice of bread and jam, whether it wouldn't be better for me to do it with a knife. Most of the best things have been brought off with a knife, and it would be a new emotion to get a knife into a French president and wriggle it around. You are wrong, said the secretary, drawing his black brows together. The knife was merely the expression of the old personal quarrel with a personal tyrant. Dynamite is not only our best tool, but our best symbol. It is as perfect a symbol of us as is incense of the prayers of the Christians. It expands. It only destroys because it broadens. Even so, thought only destroys because it broadens. A man's brain is a bomb, he cried out, loosening suddenly his strange passion and striking his own skull with violence. My brain feels like a bomb, night and day. It must expand. It must expand. A man's brain must expand if it breaks up the universe. I don't want the universe broken up just yet, drawled the Marquis. I want to do a lot of beastly things before I die. I thought of one yesterday in bed. No, if the only end of the thing is nothing, said Dr. Bull with his sphinx-like smile, it hardly seems worth doing. The old professor was staring at the ceiling with dull eyes. Every man knows in his heart that nothing is worth doing. There was a singular silence, and then the secretary said, we are wandering, however, from the point. The only question is how Wednesday is to strike the blow. I take it we should all agree with the original notion of a bomb. As to the actual arrangements, I should suggest that tomorrow morning he should go first of all to... The speech was broken off short under a vast shadow. President Sunday had risen to his feet, seeming to fill the sky above them. Before we discuss that, he said in a small, quiet voice, let us go into a private room. I have something very particular to say. Syme stood up before any of the others. The instant of choice had come at last. The pistol was at his head. On the pavement below, he could hear the policeman idly stir and stamp, for the morning, though bright, was cold. And now, we will have to wait till next time to find out what particular thing Sunday has to say. <laughs>